All right, now let's move to the other end of the lymphoid malignancy spectrum, and I'll ask Dr. Call to speak to us about B cell signaling and a wealth of new drugs that will change the, the way we treat chronic lymphocytic leukemia and uh, follicular lymphoma. Yeah, so our understanding of the B cell receptor and B cell receptor pathway signaling has really changed the face of, of CLL management and uh, similarly in some types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, every B cell has a B cell receptor. Uh, what exactly is the signal that's signaling through the B cell receptor is not entirely clear, but we know that the signaling, uh, once it gets into the cytoplasm, hits different biochemical pathways, signaling through things like uh, PI3 kinase and BTK. And uh, some of these B cell malignancies like CLL seem to be very dependent on those signaling pathways for their survival. And so if you can disrupt those pathways with an, with an effective drug, uh, the CLL cells are willing to die. And so probably the best example of that is, is the BTK inhibitor abrutinib. Uh, abrutinib was approved just in the last month for mantle cell lymphoma that's relapsed after one line of therapy. Um, probably the best new drug we've seen in mantle cell lymphoma ever. Um, single agent response rate of um, between 60 and 70 percent. Uh, median progression free survival of over a year, response durations of a year and a half, and, and the agent is very well tolerated. And um, the, the drug is not yet approved for CLL, but we're very optimistic that it will receive approval in um, CLL sometime in the next several months. Uh, I think um, John was the senior author on the New England Journal of Medicine paper that describes abrutinib's activity in CLL, so I should let him describe that. Well, I, th I think, as you said, you know, Brad, you know, the you know, ibrutinib is very active in both CLL and you know, mantle cell lymphoma. You know, and I think what's impressive in both, in both studies that were in the New England Journal of Medicine you know, was the durability of remission. You know, and with both, with both mantle cell lymphoma and CLL, you have, a, you, know, you have a plateau beyond a certain period of time where, again, the follow-up in both these studies is still short. But you know, a subset of patients are having very durable remissions. You know, CLL and to a lesser extent mantle cell lymphoma, you know, have you know, something very, very unusual that you don't with, with these agents that you don't see with other chemotherapy agents. And that you, as, a, as an oncologist, you treat with chemotherapy with an antibody, and you expect you expect the blood disease, the lymph nodes, and everything to decrease. And with these agents in mantle cell lymphoma and CLL, often you will see a lymphocytosis early when you give it. And this is a class effect of the drug. Uh, and, you know, if, and it's important if, if people are using these to realize this is not progression of disease, but in fact, it's a manifestation of response. And if you follow the patient for a period of time, you'll see this go away. And typically, with this early lymphocytosis, you see the lymph nodes shrinking and, you know, and the patients feel better. So if, you're, if you suggest to the patient stopping the drug, they'll probably tell you to get lost <laughs> anyways. Um, and rightly so. <laughs> say, the, um, but you say in the, it, what, what's most striking, I think, in, in where these agents are really going to impact you know, the greatest is when they move to the upfront setting. Um, you know, in the upfront setting you know, for CLL, you know, the, the response rate, when you, when you consider using the classic response rate, it's only 70%, but another 20% of people have persistent lymphocytosis and otherwise no active disease. And when you look at 26 months, 96% of patients are still progression free. And again, you know, to put that in perspective with our best chemoimmunotherapy for elderly patients, you know, the median progression free survival, you know, at, or at that same time point, we'd have about 50% of patients progressing. So it's so really- So are you suggesting a therapeutic paradigm that replaces FCR and or BR with single agent abrutinib, or do you see abrutinib as a maintenance uh, in the upfront setting? What's going to happen? Yeah, well, that's, I think that's the, big, that's the big question right now, and, and the dissecting CLL out into the younger patients, where particularly the patients with low risk disease that have IGVH mutated disease and, you know, say, favorable cytogenetics, trisomy 12 or 13Q. You know, there's been evidence at several meetings you know, presented from the German group, the, you know, the um, MD Anderson group, that FCR 
has about a 70% chance of inducing a durable emission that might it, it persist to nine years or more, where there's a suggestion of a plateau, where in that younger group of patients where FCR is appropriate with favorable uh, prognostic factors, we may induce at least a very prolonged remission. And you know, say when you get out to nine years, you know, even acute leukemia doctors will use the word cure, and, and CLL doctors are starting to use that it's word. It's a four-letter word. I don't yeah. think we'll use that. <laughs> But for, you know, but that's unfortunately that's only as that's only about 10 to 20 percent of CLL patients. The other 80 percent either have unfavorable risk factors and are young, or you know, or are older with CLL where FCR is not appropriate. And in that group of patients, you know, a, a, a kinase inhibitor such as ibrutinib or you know, say another you know, B cell receptor kinase inhibitor given as continuous therapy might be something that's you know that's continued. Yeah, you know, for an extended period of time, and you know, I think the question will be, can we stop these after a period of time? And you know, that's still an open question. So I was going to ask about that. So we're talking about another imatinib here, a, a lifetime of therapy with an oral kinase inhibitor for a disease that's more common than chronic myeloid leukemia. Yeah, this that's a that's a great question, and and the the response, you know, the response you know, with you know, ibrutinib or you know, GS1101, you know, the P110 delta inhibitor. You generally see partial responses, although they're very durable partial responses. You know, whereas in CLL before, when we saw partial responses, that usually meant that people would be progressing you know, quickly, and so we don't see the deep molecular deep molecular CRs like you see in CML. But you know that paradigm is still possible because, as I said, you know with you know, with 26 months of follow up. You know, we're not seeing relapses, and patients are, t are tolerating ibrutinib very well with evidence of immune restoration. So there, whereas you would expect with a BTK inhibitor, patients would develop hypogamma globulinemia, and in these patients you see with, over time, restoration of their normal immunoglobulins, where their IgAs and IgM go up, and you don't see increased infections. And what are you going to do for all those academic careers that were built on identifying risk factors such as 17P and so on? I mean. Uh, those people will have to switch to something else like AML. Unfortun unfortunately, th these new drugs these new drugs work better than anything that we had for 17P CLL, but th that's the risk of the group of patients that still relapse on these. And so, you know, that's where we're probably going to be applying combination therapies. But getting back to a question you asked a minute ago, I'm, I mean, ibrutinib can be very effective in people who are highly chemotherapy refractory. Fludarabine refractory is it's it's more effective in 17p deleted than probably any chemotherapy agent you could pull off the shelf, so that actually gives me some hope that this drug or maybe this drug in combination in some sort of rational combination could replace chemotherapy in the frontline setting at some point. Although admittedly, I think it'll take several years to get to that point where we ha have proven that that's a that's a worthwhile trade-off. The other point about the, the, this agent and this class of agents is they're, it's important that they're well tolerated because it's oral daily therapy. And by and large, patients tolerate um, these agents very well. Um, n mild nausea for some patients, diarrhea can be issues for some patients that can often be mitigated with uh, dose reduction. Um, uh, myelosuppression is minimal. Um, infections do not appear to be above background for that patient population, so um, it, it really is a targeted agent that seems to be hitting the CLL cell and, and leaving the patient alone by and large. And can you give us some sense?